a pleasure to welcome Professor Ahmed Day uh, here at the university to give a talk in our weekly series that we're establishing slowly but surely to distinguish uh, public lecture series in the School of Historical Studies. Um, I met Professor Day and the opportunity to meet Professor Day last year, about a year ago, in Airport, uh, which is in uh, East Germany, and we were both fellows at the Max Weber Center for Advanced Social Science Research. Um, one of the very stimulating and prestigious uh, research institutions in, in Germany. Um, professor Day is well, he's a professor of history at Calcutta University, and I was very happy to announce that he was also the mentor, PhD mentor of uh, Dr. Khani. And so we're very happy to hear, you know, have you here, and particularly the students must be appreciating the fact that you're here. You have such a wonderful teacher, Dr. Khani. Uh, Professor Day's area of research is primarily Islam and uh, Islamic mysticism, medieval and modern South Asia, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing him you know, talk about this uh, today. Um, he's published, uh, has a large number of publications, including I think there's a new book coming out, um, or has come out already. It's in the press, Islam and Islamic Mysticism in Medieval and Modern South Asia, um, which has a foreword from Professor Francis Robinson. Um, Professor Day has held various prestigious fellowships, one of them being the Bach Rodenberg Fellowship at the South Asia Institute of the University of Heidelberg, which is arguably one of the most important centers for South Asian studies, not only in Europe, but also um, outside of Europe. He's been a fellow of the Charles Wallace India Trust uh, at the University of London, visiting professor twice at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, and as I said, he was visiting fellow at the Max Weber Center for Advanced Social Science Research. So we're very pleased to have you here, particularly because it also um, connects to the courses that Dr. Khan has been teaching, and I'm sure the students and the faculty will appreciate your presence here. And we also look forward to the talk as well as to your teaching tomorrow. For the students. Please, welcome. Thank you, Professor Ali Tomalik, for a very generous introduction. I am particularly grateful uh, to the School of Historical Studies, uh, here in my case represented by many, represented by Professor Malik and my dear former student, Dr. Kashyap Goni, wherever I am invited by this uh, sort of a joint venture, a joint academic venture, I cannot say no. That's why definitely I was very prompt to respond. Prompt to respond very positively. Now, uh, actually today is a, a lecture. I was thinking that there will be people representing the environmental science department. But I will be told that many of them are not available. But anyway, since I have decided to touch upon this aspect, this is not my comfort zone. But I, I approach environment from my comfort zone, that is mysticism and Islam in the South Asian context. But I will do that, as I have promised that I will just try to explore some linkages between mysticism, Islam and environment. So I will continue to do that, but I will not be as enthusiastic as I would have been in the presence of people representing that faculty. But in any case, uh, this is very interesting. For example, in the 1990s, if you see the historiography, you will find that some major works have been produced uh, in the 70s, 80s, and in the early 90s on Islam in Bengal, medieval and modern Bengal, Islam, Islamic mysticism, emergence of scriptural fundamentalism, if I may use this, this term. But I was wondering that there was a gap. For example, many of the scholars were not consulting certain sources relating to South Asian Islam, particularly. Uh, with reference to Bengal, that is literature relating to the Prophet Muhammad. As Sadi in the medieval period in the 13th century has said, Baal as Khuda Tuya Mashur as, this is the Persian, that is after God you are the greatest. So, Prophet is very important, Prophetology is very important in Islamic identity, in Islamic community formation and assertion of that community 
and the establishment of a distinct from India. You cannot ignore profit. But I have seen that the majority of the literature, uh, amounting to 90% of the staff, hardly refer to this sort of literature that remained untapped, that incentivized me to explore that untraversed territory. So, the so I have classified this sort of literature into three categories, but today I will be concentrating on mainly the four elements as I have uh, indicated or I have promised. Uh, one sort of literature found that there is a swelling volume of this sort of literature, Sirat literature, biography of the prophet, Sirat literature, biography of the prophet. Uh, uh, mainly, uh, this is available all over the Islamic world. In case of Bengal, this is available mainly in the chaste Bengali literature. It has something to do with the optimum utilization of the printing, printing press, printing technology. For today's lecture, I have very little to do with that, but tomorrow I may be in a position to discuss that in some details. So, Sira is a sort of a chaste memory literature dealing with the prophet's Bible. Uh, this is mainly catering to the requirements of the newly emerging Bengali educated middle class, appearing from the mid 19th, particularly from the uh, family of the 19th century. We, today, we have nothing to do with this sort of literature. There was another sort of literature that I have noticed. Mohru, you enjoy a national holiday in India uh, on Prophet's birthday. Miladun Nabi, Mohru's literature, commemorating the birth of the Prophet. So, this is not only the birth of the Prophet, you get information about his life also in Mohru's literature. This is interesting. This is general, uh, it's actually a liaison between the Bengal countryside and urban Bengal. Because partly you will find this is available in prose form and partly available in versical form. Versical form because it is also addressing the illiterate population to aid the memorization process. If something is project, uh, presented in rhymes or in sound, it is easier to remember. You can understand. Uh, an educated middle class uh, can just browse through the pages again and again. The, the question of memorization is not important for an urban educated middle class. But that is, memorization is important for illiterate people in the countryside. This is again important because some of the scholars have made some sweeping comments that with the advent and optimal utilization of building technology, we notice in South Asia the triumph of the individual. The triumph of the individual. My humble submission is that, as I mentioned, you have to understand, in the uh, abstract I have mentioned, you have to understand Islam with what is Islam's. You have to understand Islam with its, with its multi layered complexity, with its heterogeneity. For example, Islam as it flourished in Morocco was quite different from the Islam that engulfed Indonesia or Bengal. In Bengal and Indonesia, Islam spread with the spread of wet rice cultivation. And recently I found one document of Morocco, some one person visited Morocco and in the graffiti of the Terika, uh, he has written about his experiences. There was not a single reference to the Moroccan countryside. So this urban experience was quite old in Morocco. From 7th century onwards, you get great cities. You have to be mesmerized by these sort of architectural designs of urban Morocco, which you will only find in the Bengal countryside. <coughs> this is again a problem. If you think about the language movement, International Language Day was celebrated on 21st February. 54% of the Pakistani, undivided Pakistani population spoke Bengali, but Bengali uh, lacked that official status. There was a movement, and ultimately they were successful. I'm not terribly believe in that. And that's why. Uh, one of the largest Muslim communities in the world uh, are domiciled in Bengal and they have an agrarian base. So if you have to discuss South Asian in Islam, I think you cannot ignore Bengal. I mean, I can't divide it Bengal. But recently I have been reading some books. There is not a single chapter on Bengal. And the title of the books are becoming very uh, just misleading that this is a book on South Asian Islam. But not a single chapter on Bengal. I am not mentioning that because at the moment I am reading some of the books. But I will be polite, generally I am a polite person, I, am not, I can't be very harsh. Anyway, so it's a secret which we are sharing, but you need not divulge it to the public space. I will maintain that decency and politeness, even when revealing that. Just. So, uh, this is the thing, and the third category which is our concern today, that is, that we shall be highlighting folk songs. Now, again, this is not unique in Bengal, but 
my predecessors who carried out research on Bengal, they hardly put emphasis on these sort of sources while uh, chronicling the Islamic past in Bengal. But this is very important. My argument is that you can understand the environmental changes, eco geographical changes, folk songs is an important source for our proper understanding of Bengal, which created ripples in the Bengal countryside. For example, uh, this is interesting. Uh, this is the boat of faith, this is Muhammad. If Muhammad is entreated, the boat, the soul, sails safe, safely from one shore to another. Just like Bhavashanda Tarivari Vinamha, Ori slave is entreated uh, to ensure a safe passage from one to another, from towards the ocean of phenomenal being. So it's a sort of a parallelism in that sense. So Muhammad is that boat and Allah is the mast. Allah is the mast. So this is the notion. So in Bengal, in the Bengals, in river and Bengal, this is important. That's uh, so why I, I was tempted to refer to the environmental impact on these folk songs and Islam, evolution of Islam. For example, in the Middle East, in the arid region of the Middle East, you will not find this sort of songs. You will find that the boatman prophet, Hemsman prophet, is being replaced by the camel driver prophet. Here is Shatrapan Alistana, who camel driver, please move slowly so that we can keep track. This is the song that uh, will <laughs> be composed by Jami and others in the Persian or West Asian context. So in Bengal, this cabin driver is replaced by the boatman prophet or the hemsman prophet. So these folk songs are very important. I have categorized the folk songs. We will have patience to come back to those categorizations. Uh, but before going into that, let us see how eco-geographical changes increase or development of weight rise cultivation had an impact on Islamization in Bengal. So that's the convergence of Islamization and the spread of weight rise cultivation, land reclamation project, and the changing course, changing the course of the river, major river in Bengal. There's a dam neck posture movement towards the east, though in the ecological sense, not in the political sense. So if we see the land developments in the 16th century, 16th century is the century of community formation, Islamic community formation. And 19th century, we shall be mainly, as I mentioned, we shall be dealing with modern Bengal. 19th century is the century uh, when this quest for the community solidarity assertion or a distinct community identity was being established in the 19th century. So 16th century is the period of community formation and 19th century is the century of the assertion of the community to maintain a distinct community identity as compared to other communities and certain symbols were brought into play and there was still a tension between the universal symbols of Islam and the uh, local symbols of Islam we shall mention that of course Prophet Muhammad and Allah, Allah they are the universal symbols of Islam they will be strong competitors for the local symbols of Islam like the Mushi, like the Bawal singers and others uh, we shall come back to that but regarding the medieval period we shall see if you see the Mughal land documents uh, generally, Mughal land documents are silent about those uh, who are receiving the lands, but when it is being received by someone who has something to do with the mosque or the Sufi shrine, then it is very explicitly mentioned in the land document. This is important. This is one important thing. That is why the state is providing plow, state, state is in, uh, providing uh, other sorts of incentives so that this person carries out this sort of land reclamation project and ultimately this land can be Hello, land can be converted into cultivable land. So, uh, weight rise cultivation, I think, and the state of this is important. And even uh, that can be uh, corroborated by other types of sources, like Chumni Mongol, Mongol literature, Chumni Mongol. You will find that Kalpetu, uh, the major figure with the Chumni Mongol Kampo, is just uh, is associated with this uh, land reclamation. And also, we will find apart from Jomi Mongol literature, you will also find Sufi geographical literature. You will find the same reference to this land reclamation project and the spread of white rice cultivation, establishment of Muslim settlements. So those, uh, this is interesting. In Western Bengal, and again there is a complexity, you have to understand that. In Western Bengal, it is not that exposed to the ravages of nature. That's why you will find the Nogbunaya school, the logician school in uh, Nagodi, it was still intact. It was the citadel of Nagodi school, Nagodi. That was still intact because this area was not regularly uh, ravaged by the uh, nature. 
not exposed to the ravages of nature, but eastern delta was exposed to the ravages of nature. So uh, that's why things was more volatile, more fluid in eastern Bengal. So people went out to carry out agricultural activities and mainly they represented the lower uh, caste of the Hindu society. And these were the people who got Islam Islamized because they were not, because of their prolonged stay in this reclamation activities, they were not taken back within the fold of Hinduism and they just embraced Islam because this sort of activities took place uh, surrounding a mosque or a Sufi shrine. And most of the time, this leadership, charismatic leadership was provided by the Sufi people uh, in the local community. So, Max Weber, Weber would say that there are two types of uh, charismas, hereditary charismas as well as acquired charismas. This daring people piece had acquired charisma as well as hereditary charisma because genealogy uh, is, a, is an important legitimizer uh, in Islam as well as in other religious communities, I would assume. So, they could trace back their origin to the, to the Prophet. They could get back their, their origin to the Prophet in a genealogical tree. This is very much important. Uh, <coughs> so, in, in Bengal, uh, we see in the 19th century, middle, middle of the 19th century, we see uh, that steamer is flying on the Ganges. Steamer is flying on the Ganges. This is one important development which will probably have officials to come back uh, to that. Let us now classify. There are very exquisitely beautiful folk songs in, in Bengal. Uh, for example, Bauer songs. Uh, it has originated from probably from the Sanskrit word Vatula, that means man intoxicated, or maybe from the uh, Arabic term Aurya, Baur, Aurya. Aurya means friends of God. Wali means friend of God. Aurya is the friends of God. So both can be married. Uh, there is a discourse going on about regarding the origin of this word. And this is a, by the mendicant singers, you know, recently a film uh, just uh, directed by Gautam Ghosh, Modern Manus, the man of art. We shall mention that man of art is the prophet on uh, here in the power imagination. So that <coughs> they are the mendicant singers because of this uh, economic change in Bengal, these people just uh, got involved in this sort of song. They provided peace and solace to the peasants and other those who were involved in uh, crafts <coughs> industry during this crisis, that what they have provided them with some sort of self-confidence in the challenges, constraints of colonial regime. And uh, we shall mention that later on. Uh, and there are other types of folk songs, Jari songs. Actually in Bengali, you cannot pronounce Z. Actually it should have been Zari, Zaridan from Persian, means lamentation. Uh, lamentation commemorating uh, the tragic death of Hussein at the Battle of Karbala. So it's, it's mainly sung during uh, the modern festival, but there are certain districts like Joshua and Purna where this is a seasonal song, not a religious song as such. But in Mahonshik, definitely, and sometimes in Mushidabad also, this is a uh, religious song, commemorating the uh, tragic uh, death of Hussein. And in Eastern Bengal, in Chittagong, uh, Chittagong is an interesting place uh, because they see uh, that this uh, sea, you find sea and also mountain. In Chittagong. So there's a place in Chittagong called Mile Manor. So this uh, they almost they resemble the Sufis and they sing this sort of Mile Manor Mile Manor songs. They challenge the uh, Orthodox Islam and they are heterodox in their uh, mode of functioning. And again there are other types of songs, rain songs, songs to invite rain, and also songs of gay rivers, which we have we have studied these sort of uh, these sort of songs. What we get. Uh, and I just have to explain this thing. Till the 1970s or even uh, during the late 60s, uh, the secular nationalists and even the nationalist students, including the Marxist students, they projected Sufism, uh, Baos as a symbol of national integration. I appreciate that because I understand that in the aftermath of the vivisection of the South continent, it was a necessity. It was a necessity, it was a period when India was experiencing this nation building process. We should have emphasized those symbols which might have uh, just promoted national integrity. So they have done the right thing, I appreciate that. Having said that, I must uh, share this with you that after so many decades after independence, I think we can be a little bit critical about the analysis of these sort of things, vowels and folk singers and Sufis, whether we can call it symbols of national integration or whether we should be 
aware of the complexities, uh, these sort of multi-layered movements representing heterogeneity, we have to understand that uh, that is the thing. So, I'm, what my position is that there was syncretism, no doubt, but it was not unalloyed syncretism as the secular nationalist uh, would like us to believe. It was not unalloyed syncretism. At times, it was just flavored by a, a spirit of competitive religiosity. Competitive religiosity was there. Uh, this is very much important. In support of my hypothesis, I will just cite some songs. They are, you will find. Uh, if you on your own can just come to this conclusion whether you can call it syncretism or whether you will have to be satisfied with the term competitive spiritually. I will leave it to you there. Uh, so, this is the thing. Uh, and cosmogony or cosmology is very important in folk songs. It's a legitimizing process once again, legitimizing process. Uh, why we shall explain that why cosmogonical songs particularly became popular in the 19th century, they got. And there is another type of song which would emphasis uh, on Noor Muhammad. I just very briefly explain this. Uh, Noor means light, Noor Muhammad, and Noor means light. It means the belief, according to believers, the God created from his own life. Uh, own light, God created Mormon. For the comfort, the comfort of Mormon, everything else was created. Art, uh, air, uh, water, everything else was created because of the comfort of uh, no Mormon. So no Mormon is the cause and every creation of everything else is the effect. Why this theory was getting popularity, uh, gaining popularity in the 19th century? And this is not unique about the Bengali folk scene. Because in northern India also, in the northern Indian countryside also, in the 19th century, you will find the Baravi Ulama, Baravi Ulama also put emphasis on the intercessory aspect of Sufism. They also put emphasis on this through Mahama concept, which is a legitimizing act on their part. Why they put emphasis on this aspect? Because it was a period when the Christian missionaries were carrying out their proselytizing activities and put emphasis on uh, this uh, cosmogonical theory and projected Jesus Christ as the origin of creation, origin of creation. To counter that, to prove that Islam is not going to be vulnerable before this sort of proselytizing activities, Islam is more authentic as a religion, they put, uh, put emphasis on this rule normal concept, it's a legitimizing act. So in this context, you can understand, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an example of complete spirituality rather than synthetic. Complete spirituality rather than synthetic. Now, uh, I must give you some example. For example, uh, there was one uh, Jari song, as I mentioned. Now, Jari is not, is not a solo. It's a song between two competing groups. It's song between two competing groups to provide a sort of a dramatic impact in an otherwise agrarian, uh, rice economy oriented, dull village economy to provide some sort of emotional satisfaction. Uh, these sort of Jari songs are offered. It has a dramatic impact in village society. Uh, so, uh, it's, a, it's a competitive element in these sort of songs. So, one song was Jabar Nam. Jabar means poison, poison episode. Poison episode. So, one day, Gabriel, again, this is interesting. Uh, there's a competition going on between Gabriel, Gabriel or Jibril and Prophet Mom. Gabriel is emerging in one of the songs and uh, emerging with two shards. One was blue, another was red. Red shard was for Prophet's grandson Hussein who will again martyred out. He was told, Prophet was told that his uh, grandson Hussein will again martyred him at the battle of Karbala and Hassan will be poisoned to death. So the blue shirt was reserved for Hassan. So naturally the Prophet was very much uh, just uh, very, very, uh, uh, he was very much agreed to know that the future of his very favorite grandsons Hassan and Hussein. Uh, we shall come back to this uh, symbolic aspect also. Uh, so, then Gabriel was uh, discuss, having, having a discussion with uh, Fatima, the beloved daughter of the Prophet. Now this is interesting. Majority of the Sufi orders in India claim their origin from Ali and Fatima. Damad Damas Kalantar Ali Shah Bhairanam. So Ali and Fatima, they are the symbols of mystical Islam in South Asia. But there is only one Sufi order, Raksmandiyas, who claim origin from Abu Bakr. This is important. Because Abu Bakr is the symbol of spiritual Islam. And Fatima and Ali, they are the symbols of mystical Islam. So, um, Fatima was addressing Gabriel as Choto Chacha, his younger uncle. So, Gabriel was very much annoyed 
So why are you addressing me as the young uncle or chota chacha? I am senior to your father. Well, let us proceed to uh, the Prophet Muhammad. They proceeded before the uh, Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet said, uh, Gabriel or Jibril, did you see anything when you were born? Yes, I saw on a near the horizon a starry light. I was that starry light. No, no, Muhammad. Light of Muhammad. So I pre existed, Gabriel. So this is the legitimizing process. So Prophet is even superior uh, to the archangels. So in this way, Islam was being legitimized and in popular discourse. So the Jari songs played this role. This is generally denied you know, during the nationalist movement. The Jari singers played a significant role in bringing about the solidarity between the Hindus and Muslims against the struggle against colonialism. But Jari song also played this sort of a role, the role of this uh, religious competition or community spiritually. So uh, this is one example. Uh, another Jari song is very important. Uh, that is known as Kulsuwe Mayu Bani. This is interesting. Mayu Bani means actually Mayu Bani. Mayu Bani. Mayu Bani means hospital. But she is not. means another daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. Now there is a distinction between Fatima and Kulsum. Kulsum is the wife of Usman, Prophet uh, uh, Khalif, Khalif Usman. Usman is a successful trader. Successful trader. So Kulsum uh, is a friend. Kulsum is a friend. But Fatima appears in public space with a shabby rapper, as I have mentioned, like the Sufis. She is the representative of mystical Islam. Uh, so she is the representative of uh, the have nots, Ajlaf. Ajlaf Muslim. You will not find that in Quran. Uh, but in the Indian context, probably uh, as an impact of caste system, this sort of thing you want. Ajlaf means uh, Indian Muslims or converted Muslims. Symbol of Ajlaf. Ajlaf is also an economic category. They are the deprived people, um, Muslims in India. And Kulsum became the representative of Ashraf. Aristocratic Muslims who play foreign origin. Those who are not converted. This is the notion. So there is a struggle. But this, this should not be there in Islam. Islam is based on egalitarian principles. But in India, this is denied. Uh, so, uh, the, during this community solidarity, these sort of questions became very important, particularly during the late 19th century, because the political leaders found that this is going to erode the vitality of Islam, and Christian missionaries with their running words, or the Brahmos, or the Adiyo Shamanis with their running words might be just reconverting those Muslims, or the Allah, who are living within the fringes of Islam, back to their uh, own respective religions. So, they wanted to bridge this gap. So uh, that was done at the folk level by the Jari singers and also others. So there is a Jari called uh, Kulsu and Mejman, hospitality of Kulsu, the friend, uh, daughter of the Prophet, who just was used to hoarding, just reflecting a contemporary economic practice. Hoarding was practiced by Kulsu, that is, she did not uh, observe the Saka. Saka is one of the five pillars of Islam, she did not observe the Saka. So my argument is that, you see, when there is emphasis on this zakat, so I have said the same picture is there, I am accepting that. But at the same time, we have to be a little bit cautious. Reformist Islam or revivalist Islam is emphasized through these folk songs as well. Folk songs are being used as vehicles to promote revivalist Islam or spiritual uh, fundamentalism. That's why there is an emphasis on zakat, and Kulsum is not observing zakat. So she is going to be punished. So this is very important. So Kulsu has invited everyone in Mokka and Modina in a party, but she excluded, deliberately excluded Fatima and Hassan and Hussein. So uh, on that day, very auspicious day, the Prophet also emerged there in that party. But in a supernatural event, all the food stuff stored in the cooldown of Kulsu disappeared. So she felt very much ashamed that he will lower her prestige before her refined urban guests. The Prophet said that why did you invite Fatima, the beloved of God? So Radha is the beloved of Krishna, Fatima is the beloved of God. Radha Krishnaism is being used here. Very interesting. So Fatima is the counterpart of Radha. We shall later on